our restaurant, I mean, we are selling a lot of shrimp. I mean, we, we probably go through 100, 150 pounds of shrimp a week. I think Andy and I are interested in shrimp because uh, in the first place, it's the most popular seafood in the United States. I think what fascinates me about shrimp is that they're really just a small little invertebrate. Um, they're, not, they're not a fish. Uh, they're not something that people feel is really like warm and cuddly, like a, you know, a dolphin or a whale. This is an animal that has a varied diet that includes the waste products of other organisms in the ecosystem. It's a scavenger, really more like an aquatic insect. When you compare it to a lot of other animals, it sure makes sense because they're pretty low on the food chain. People love to eat this little bug that runs around on the sea floor. We eat a lot of it. We eat over four pounds per person. That's a lot of shrimp. When most of us go to the supermarket and we buy shrimp, how much do we really know about it? What's very interesting about this sign is that up here it says Gulf shrimp, but down here it says frozen and farmed in Mexico. That could be a little confusing because farmed shrimp is not grown in the Gulf, it's grown on a farm. I actually had stopped eating shrimp for a while uh, because for the most part, it was really hard to identify where it was coming from. If the product has already been processed, it doesn't have to be labeled where it's from. So you buy breaded shrimp at the local grocery store and you have no idea where that shrimp product has come from. 90% of the shrimp consumed in the U.S. are imported. 90% of those are farmed. Most of those come from Southeast Asia and South America. Most people are unaware that the shrimp that they eat is most likely imported from another country and that chances are it was raised on a farm in that country. The distributors are buying from so many different producers and the retailers are buying from so many different distributors. So they can be getting seafood from anywhere and everywhere. Unless you go out of your way to buy wild caught U.S. shrimp, it's very hard to find a shrimp in the grocery store that is actually from the U.S. pretty slow, the price has been way down and the fuel way up, it's a struggle. When I first got in it, it was pretty good money to be made and I sent my kids to, uh, both of them to, you know, private school and uh, then it got, you know, it got worse. My dad worked for an aluminum company right here close to town. Hung around here a lot, talking to all the fishermen all my life. This facility here came up in a bankruptcy. Well, and I thought maybe it's a chance we could make a living. Normal routine is they work at night most of the time. The shrimp tend to migrate in the mud, and this rig is more or less designed to get that shrimp out of the mud. The way you catch it in the ocean is you go out on these boats, they drag big trawl nets behind them. These trawls move along the, the floor of the ocean. There's actually a chain that drags on the ocean floor and stirs up uh, all the sediment and, and benthic environment so that the shrimp end up in the net. About midnight, they'll pick up the first drag if there's not too much fish. And they'll clean it up and they'll put it the rigs back over again and drag till, till daylight. When I started, you know, a 10 or 12 day trip was, was a was a trip. We got the freezer boats going. We told the guys to have 30, 35 days. Our shrimp that comes in from the Gulf is all uh, packed frozen in five pound blocks. Once it's frozen, you don't know when it was frozen, you know, technically. 
Now we're pushing for 40 to 45 days to stay out because it takes that much to actually cover expenses and, and actually make you some money. Well, no, I mean, that's all I've ever done. Fortunate or blessed or whatever a lot of people say. I seem to do better than a lot of people, but I try, I work hard. we had uh, I think 4,500 federal shrimp permits in the Gulf of Mexico. We have now probably 1,200. They had a Gulf King fleet that had like 70 something boats at one time. They were everywhere. I mean there was this booming business and now it's like a ghost town. I don't know what happened down there. The whole industry is, is, is getting so hard to operate uh, financially. I mean realistically on the bigger shrimp, we need to be getting six and seven dollars a pound, and we're getting five. Last year we got three, and that wasn't even in the ball game. First summer on my old boat, I'll never forget it. Twenty-six thirty tails, five seventy. Now they're about three something. We were supposed to be getting some tariff money. Now it's been like a couple years. We haven't seen nothing. No compensation for the imported shrimp. You know, cutting our throat. What's the biggest expense? Fuel, probably. Yeah, fuel. And uh, we, could, we were here two years ago in the same place when it was like $4 a gallon. Don't have too many good fishing days anymore. Some of the basic facts for the shrimp industry look like this. They go out for about a month, and in that month they burn 10,000 gallons of diesel fuel, and they fill the boat up with about 40,000 pounds of shrimp. Just in terms of weight, that's almost two pounds of fuel for every pound of shrimp. So the boats actually come back in lighter than they were when they left. From an energy standpoint, this fishery just doesn't seem like a very efficient way to produce food. And of course, burning all that fuel has an impact on the environment. And there's other things to take into consideration. Catching shrimp from the wild uh, also could potentially result in the destruction of habitat. I mean, they usually use trawls to, uh, that disturb the substrate, that rip up seagrass, that suspend sediments, that uh, result in a lot of bycatch. National Marine Fisheries Service puts a lot of pressure on us for, uh, for the bycatch that we catch out there, for the red snapper that we're killing, the, the turtles that we're catching. We're pulling turtle devices, have for a number of years. If a turtle does get in your net, it hits those bars, and it goes right out the top. That's a benthic trawl fishery, and there is nothing worse than that. People say, well, you're dragging too much in the Gulf of Mexico. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's a, a cultivation. Our nets drag the bottom. I think we're actually bringing nutrients out of the bottom. That's my own theory. Some fisheries are much more efficient than others, but dragging nets on the bottom of the ocean floor is crazy. But no matter how they go after them, there may not be enough shrimp out there to catch. I don't know that we could ever reach the demand of the, of the United States cons consumers. 10 years ago, we were probably somewhere in the range of 25% of the shrimp consumed in the United States was from domestic shrimp. You know, I think we're in the 12 to 15% range, maybe now. So even the shrimp fishermen down here in Palacios, which is one of the top three shrimping ports in the whole state of Texas, will tell you that there will never be enough shrimp fished out of the Gulf to meet the demand in America for shrimp. So where are we gonna get our shrimp? I think the consumer's misled. They go to a, to a freezer case and they may see a shrimp boat on a pedestal picture and they assume that that is caught in the wild and a lot of that's all pond raised shrimp. Nine times out of 10, that product is coming from a, a shrimp farm 
in most likely Southeast Asia. Last year, shrimp was uh, over $5 billion uh, industry coming into the U.S. I kept on hearing about the, the impacts of shrimp aquaculture in Southeast Asia, not only on the environment, but on me because I didn't know whether those shrimp were treated with pesticides or antibiotics. In 2006, I believe it was, there was um, FDA studies on uh, shrimp that came into this country and 18% had uh, nitrofurans, which is a possible carcinogenic drug on them. 18%. Then we started looking at how much percentage food and drug was actually doing inspections on shrimp coming into this country. It was a very uh, minute amount. Although less than 2% of our seafood is actually being inspected at our borders, a large percentage of that seafood has problems. It has trace amounts of drugs that um, are outright banned in the U.S. From our data, we found that shrimp by far was the most common product to be uh, found with veterinary drug residues. Unfortunately, laws that we have in the U.S. only apply to seafood raised in the U.S. The number of legal drugs are higher in other countries. The routine use of low-level antibiotics in animal production leads to uh, the creation of these superbugs or drug-resistant bacteria. You know, MRSA, which is methicillin-resistant staph, um, now is a bigger killer than uh, HIV-AIDS in America from the antifungals, antibacterials, treat it with stuff to make it look fresher. I just lost all confidence in imported farm shrimp. There's always gonna be that bad bunch out there that's just not doing things right. But from a food safety perspective, I actually have a preference to farm-raised seafood because I know that the product has gone through the cold chain process a lot faster than it normally does on a fishing vessel. You know, they put all the rules and regulations on us over here to make sure we're raising a clean product. They need to play by the same rules. We need the imports, don't get me wrong, but we need clean imports. On this site, we have uh, 320 acres in production. In that part of the farm, we do about 3,000, max 3,500 pounds per acre. What you call a semi-intensive culture. This side of the farm, we can do 6,500 pounds per acre, okay. 7,000 pounds per acre. So it's, we're almost doubling up what we can do. We've been told that in Belize, there's very little in the way of uh, antibiotics or, or pesticides or herbicides um, because of the quality of the management of the farms here and the quality of the environment, uh, that they don't need to use a lot of the extra chemical helpers that, that are used in Asia. I have always believed that antibiotic is an excuse uh, for, that people use to cover up errors that you're making in the field. Mm -hmm. If you run a tight operation, you shouldn't have to use it. We don't even use pesticides, herbicides, those things aren't necessary really in the culturing of shrimp. The most basic kind of shrimp farm is a grow-out farm where the larvae come from a hatchery, and the farmer buys those, puts them in these big ponds full of salt water, and puts in feed several times a day. Feed is 40 to 50% of your production costs. There's a single component in that equation called success that you have to go after, it would be feed. It's an absolute imperative. The variation starts to occur with how intensively you grow out those shrimp. In Asia, there's only one or two shrimp per square yard of, uh, of pond. Because of those low densities, it means you need a lot of pond space to grow 
a large number of shrimp. And that's where the devastation of the mangroves uh, tends to happen. The typical shrimp farm is located right on the coast, and that often means it's in or near the wetland habitat. But the proximity of the sea is important for these shrimp farms so that they don't have to spend a lot of money pumping seawater into their ponds and then pumping the effluent water back out. Okay, now we're picking up some effluent. Yeah. That on the surface again. Yeah. This is sort of a worst case scenario, and here's your spot. This is stuff coming off the farm. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's harvesting really hard right now, so. So for this few hundred meters in here, this is an impact that we're trying to roll back. And this is all related to harvest because he's yeah. draining it's, his it's particularly his It's particularly bad right now because of harvest, yeah. You know, if you, if you find some of the remaining seagrass beds here and you pull up some of the seagrass, it'll often be laced with different kinds of filamentous algae. And of course, that's pretty deadly competition for a, for a seagrass. Like this. It's all this filamentous green. So this is probably a direct result of that nutrient enrichment. As you look at the coastline from the air, the shrimp farms are very obvious. They can be seen every few miles along the whole central part of the coast. My father used to fish this lagoon at night with a harpoon, and that was because he could actually use a torch at night and see to the bottom of the water. You can't do that in the lagoon anymore. This used to be an area where a manatee would spend the night. They would stay in this creek and then go out and feed on the seagrass and come back at night. They don't do that anymore. You could snorkel in that clearer area and you'll see just little whippers <laughs> coming out everywhere. You know, all just packed with juvenile lobsters. Now that has diminished over time because of the same thing. The water is not as clean. Now, this lagoon really can't handle more shrimp farms now. We're not talking about loss of habitat. We're talking about increases in nutrient loading, algal blooms that ultimately can cascade into uh, oxygen deficits. They're dumping a whole lot of pollution right directly into the ocean, which I think that shouldn't happen. I think they should have a big hauling pond that they drain this water out into this hauling pond, let it settle out, and then you release clean water back into the ocean. The Belize Barrier Reef, which is also called the Mesoamerican Reef, is the second longest barrier reef system in the world. And it's perhaps the single most significant marine habitat in the Western Hemisphere. These reefs, they offer shelter uh, for a lot of very important reef species, fish and invertebrates that basically support both the, you know, the tourism-based economy and uh, very important fisheries uh, in terms of sustaining people in the local communities. Diversity of the coral right in this particular spot is uh, is fairly high, all of which sort of adds to the complexity of the habitat. The more complex the habitat is, the more little nooks and crannies for fish and invertebrates to live in. When we learn the science of what goes on in a coral reef and mangrove ecosystem, 
we discovered that things are delicately connected. So many fish and invertebrates use the mangroves as a nursery ground. They end up spawning out on the coral reefs and their larvae drift uh, in the water and end up in the mangroves or in the seagrass. The shrimp aquaculture industry can have a cascading effect on the health of the ecosystem inshore and then a far-reaching effect offshore to the, to the barrier reef. We can't uh, solely protect mangroves or solely protect seagrass or solely protect coral reefs. We have to think about things more holistically. Every development have both good and bad, you know, and the development is very good for the local people because it provides jobs for most of the local people. The bad part would be where it's um, pollution and all that kind of thing. So you have to have a balance and nobody's sure where that balance is as yet, you know. <laughs> it's a foolhardy argument to make to say that we have no impact at all. That, that's just ridiculous. But you can mitigate impact. An ideal shrimp farm wouldn't use a lot of feed to produce the shrimp that they produce. They would close their systems so that the amount of effluent coming out is minimal or none. They're not going to use antibiotics. They're not going to cut mangroves. You know, they're going to be testing for diseases, and they'll be sure that their practices are not impacting the environment. Belize Aquaculture was founded by Sir Barry Bowen, who is one of the legendary pioneers of shrimp farming. And many of the techniques that he developed met standards for environmentally friendly uh, shrimp and for uh, raising shrimp in a sustainable manner. My dad was looking at shrimp farming way back in the early 80s, but somewhere along the way he turned into an environmentalist. He went from a bird hunter to a bird watcher. So when it came to starting Belize Aquaculture now, he didn't want to do the traditional style of big, extensive ponds. So in 95, when we started doing it, he set out with three goals. Low impact to the environment, 10,000 pounds per acre, and zero water exchange during the grow-out cycle. If you can keep that water back on the farm and never release it, there's no impact at all. And out of the gate, I think the first harvest was 9,800 pounds per acre. Why is it so important to get to that 10,000 pounds per acre. We made a choice. It's either consume a lot of land by flooding it with seawater and growing shrimp, or do it intensively in a small area so you don't have the same type of footprint. The industry average best they were doing is probably three, three and a half thousand pounds per acre. And so this was a goal set up to basically triple the production. There's 68 of these ponds. They're all four acre ponds. They're all identical in depth. What you see right there are paddle wheels. Each pond has six paddle wheels. The more shrimp there are in there, the more oxygen they need. 
To replenish that oxygen supply, you need to aerate the water in those ponds by agitating the surface so that you can get air down into the water column so that the shrimp don't suffocate. That pond we just passed, that's a recently stocked pond. So I know exactly the amount of shrimp that went in there. It was 2,160,000 post larvae, eels. We basically try to run what we call a heterotrophic system. It's basically a bacterial-based community. So essentially you're producing a lot of bacteria mm -hmm. in here for the shrimp to feed on it. For point. the shrimp to feed on it. The shrimp are eating from the flock. Yeah, and from the flock, which is on top of suspended solids, which is the bacteria and the feces and so forth. So you're just basically feeding the flock and, and you're not wasting that much feed. If we go to 20 grams, could be between 80 and 90,000 pounds of feed per pond. We got fish meal, um, which is the most important part of the feed, if you ask me. It's got soy, um, it's got wheat, corn, different d vitamins. Can you just explain the water cycle here? It's basically a recycling system. We use, we try to use 80% recycled water and 20% of the ocean water. And the crop could go from 140 to, to 180 days. Once we're done, the water is carried to our recycling ponds. We try to keep it there for at least five days for the solids to, to settle, right. and then from there, we use it again. What are the advantages of using a liner like this versus a, a clay line pond? Well, one, for the environment is, is great. You don't have any seepage, right? And when it comes to production, um, the turnaround time is quicker. You could harvest a pond for, say, today, I can clean it tomorrow, I can fill it the next day, and I'm stocking again. The methodology of how we harvest so quickly in the processing plant is next to the ponds that we freeze within 8 to 12 hours, and it actually you can taste it in the end product. It's a lot easier to access a farmed fish from a pond into the ice, whereas out on, the, on a fishing vessel, if, you know, it's not like there's a guy down in the ice hold saying, give me the fish and I'm going to put it right onto the ice. You know, it's just not happening that way. Shrimp will actually swim to the lights. So we set up a light in the middle of the pond to, to aid harvest and there's just a lot of movement. At the center of the pond, there is a two foot diameter hole in the bottom. A large pipe leads underground from that hole over to the tower. The flow of shrimp are separated from the flow of water by the harvesting machine. The water goes to a settling pond to be recycled, and the shrimp go up the tower and down the hose into the large crates which have ice inside. The shrimp are killed by the ice. When the crates are full of shrimp, the tractor pulls the whole train over to the processing plant, which is about half a mile away. At the end, we're doing 1,000 pounds a minute out of the pond. Additional cold baths at the plant bring the temperature of the shrimp down to almost zero degrees before it enters the production line. So they had about 600,000 shrimp going through that production line in, in one shift. They had 60 people taking the heads off by hand, with their pinching it off with their thumb. That means that each one of the ladies on that production line uh, has to do 10,000 shrimp in that eight-hour shift. After being headed, the shrimp are sorted by size, inspected for quality, and frozen for shipment. Before sealing the boxes, frozen gel packs are added to keep the shrimp cold on the journey ahead. So there might be 30,000 pounds of shrimp, but it's 50,000 pounds of shipping, and they do that over 100 times a year. From here, it goes to the Port of Belize. From the Port of Belize, it goes to Miami. And then it trucks to, to Rochester, New York. The power plant consists of three enormous diesel engines, 10,000 horsepower each. Together, they can produce 24 megawatts of electricity to run the aerators in the shrimp ponds, the water pumps, and the processing plant. That power plant, when it has excess capacity, delivers that electricity to the grid and powers a large portion of the southern half of the country. 
That's enough energy for 30 to 40,000 homes. We also were working on a family-based breeding program, much like they do with cattle. We go through our data as far as sexing them, weighing them, calculate out then which families are the ones I want. I, I put uh, eye tags on them, which are, are bird tags basically, yeah. but I can put it on their eye. It's a natural mating, males and females. The guys are chasing the girls. They basically swim around the tank. The females, uh, females are secreting a pheromone, and that attracts the male. They'll come up. She'll try to get away. He'll eventually win. She will slow down. They will mate. She'll then spawn the eggs within about eight hours. She'll mate about two and a half times a month. That's, a, that's the male sperm right there. So something like 100,000 actual finished shrimp will come out of one of these mating. That's incredible. water quality control your filtration, that's pretty typical of the state of the art in the industry. Uh, ours is better. <laughs> it is. It, it, really yeah. is. it really is. I actually stopped eating shrimp. As a scientist, I, I know how important the mangroves are. I wasn't sure if there were actually any solutions out there. I now see that there are solutions, and I, and I know, I think, where I would go to buy shrimp. The product that you're getting out of the bar is not any shrimp that you would buy from a commodity market. There's a difference. We are finally getting into those niche markets and are paying you the price of your investment for being sustainable. You're, you're doubling the size of the farm. Mm -hmm. Those are the plans we're aiming for next year. Uh, good morning. It's Thursday, July 14th. Our top story today is how Wegmans is discontinuing the sale of uh, Belize shrimp from Belize aquaculture. Uh, this is not a voluntary decision. Uh, what's happened is the company is closing. Company is closing. Company is closing. Over the past few years, half of the industry in Belize has been wiped out. The ever-increasing flood of Asian shrimp into the global market has depressed prices for shrimp as a commodity. We're at the, the former Nova Shrimp Farm, which used to account for half of the shrimp produced in Belize. And you can sort of get a sense of the the scale of this by the number of boots uh, here in this sort of locker room. It's rolling commodities, you know, they, they, they've harvested all the mahogany, and then they went into bananas, and then banana, oh, sugar, sugar came before bananas, and that crashed, and then bananas came in and crashed, and now it's citrus and shrimp, and they're crashing, and they chase after the new hot thing, and then it's the cold thing pretty soon, and then they're kind of stuck with what's left. American shrimp buyers are buying from Asia. They're turning to cheaper sources, and all of the other suppliers are feeling the pressure. When we started up um, over 10 years ago, our focus was primarily the US market, but um, the market is so shifted uh, because of uh, precipitous falls in prices. We do a fresh product now into Mexico. From July until about November, we go into the European market. The US market, very little. <laughs> very little anymore, simply because uh, the margins are very small. And how is the European market different than the U.S. market? Oh, it's, it's very much so. Um, it provides better margins, and um, there's more stringent in terms of quality expectations. It's troubling to think that there are farmers in Central America who have decided to forgo trying to sell in the U.S. market because they figure that uh, the quality of product accepted into the U.S. is so low that they're always going to be undercut by their competitors, and therefore they're going to look for a higher return in another market. This, in, this industry in Belize doesn't use antibiotics, so it's really not a hurdle for us at all. This is part of a requirement going into the European market. Higher quality standards in Europe means less competition from low-price mass-market shrimp exports, including those from Southeast Asia. In the United States, by contrast, 
Both prices and standards appear to be lower. The same product I'm selling right now into yeah. Mexico. I sold this product for it to the U.S. last year at half the price. It's Makes amazing. no sense. Right. <laughs> for Americans, Belize represents a vision of a jungle full of jaguars and monkeys and of a coral reef full of sharks and fish and of Mayan ruins scattered across the landscape and of these little villages with thatch-roofed huts. And uh, Americans come by the shipload to experience that vision. Can we also ask that same place to grow our food and be part of our food system to feed 300 million people in our country and six billion people around the world? I think that we have to start looking at, you know, cultivating shrimp, uh, maybe a little bit more seriously in North America and in ways that we can compete with um, the international markets. I think that we actually need to unplug in a totally different sense. Usually we talk about unplugging as getting rid of our blackberries, getting away from our modern technology. I think with regard to food production, we need to do the opposite. We need to unplug from nature so that we can save nature. One of the reasons that we've gone to insulated buildings is we're trying to generate a technology that doesn't care where it is. To grow shrimp in America, you have to solve two problems. First, you have to have a system that is disengaged from the natural environment. One of the main reasons why the shrimp aquaculture industry started looking at Central America is the fact that the climate conditions in Florida and the southern United States were too variable. These shrimp that we eat need warm, salty water. But most of our communities in North America don't have warm, salty water all year round. We keep the water at 86 degrees Fahrenheit. That's considered the optimum growth point for these animals. And the fact that we can make our own seawater, brackish water, makes us really site independent. Shrimp farms can produce a lot of waste. Most of our communities in North America can't handle a bunch of new agricultural waste. Since 2005, we've been able to use 100% recycling of our water. So we don't have any effluent. The waste production from the shrimp is internalized back into feed because they don't digest their feed completely. So a lot of that uneaten feed still has a very high food value in it. So that is recycled back into this bioflock mixture of particulate, organic, detrital solids, uh, all kinds of different bacteria, and a whole bunch of zooplankton, myofauna organisms, from nematodes to little tiny crustaceans. Basically, in a bioflock system, you're recirculating fecal material back into the food chain. Think of it more of a, an ecosystem, and it's not such a horrible thing. And all the traditional pond farming is doing the same thing. It's just that it's so much more evident here with the brown turbid water. I'll try to show you what I'm talking about for a healthy flop. I don't have my glasses on right now, but can you see individual particles? Yes, absolutely. Okay, yes. but you can see each one of those little particles is like maybe 100 microns, yeah, maybe yeah. like 10 per millimeter. Yeah, and each one of those is a little microcosm. In a fully recirculating shrimp culture system like this one, bacteria play the leading role in controlling and eliminating waste. This red line, think of that as the shrimp tank, okay? So you got shrimp in the shrimp tank, you're growing shrimp. You got to feed them. So the feed goes in. The shrimp take up a certain amount of that feed. Some of it is excreted. We excrete urine, they excrete the ammonia directly. We let bacteria oxidize it to nitrite. Another set of bacteria oxidize the nitrite to nitrate. Both of these are toxic. Ammonia and nitrite are toxic. Nitrate is relatively benign. 
We're taking that water and bringing it back into another bacterial process that is actually anoxic. You end up with nitrogen gas, and since the atmosphere is 80% nitrogen, no pollution. Shrimp are cannibalistic and eat dead shrimp. They get infected, they die, and you can lose an entire tank in two weeks. The number one bad bacteria is Vibrio. We fight Vibrio, bad bacteria, with probiotics, good bacteria. We use the probiotics to competitively exclude or inhibit pathogenic bacteria. We're trying to outcompete them or keep them at a very low level by filling up all the niches in the system. The absolute key to this technology is controlling the bacterial dynamics. Everything is bacterially driven. The ecology of the oceans, our own immune systems are 70% in our GI tract. It's all bacteria. The second thing you need to grow shrimp here in America is a market. You need a product that people want. You know, he's, he's pulling it out of the water the day before you serve it. That's, that's awesome. I mean, that's, I love it. We have used frozen shrimp in our community for so long. Our business model here is to produce 52 weeks a year and always be putting out product so that we can sell into the fresh market. Chefs appreciate that, they really do. You don't have to bread it and you don't have to deep fry it because it just has a natural, clean, wonderful flavor. So we love it. The world has gone awry in shipping food. I mean, you're just as likely to go to, when you go buy asparagus or oranges or apples or almost anything these days, it's flown halfway across the world. That just seems ridiculous to me. There's, uh, there's tons of potential here in the United States to produce our own seafood. In the past several years, there's been a surge of interest in recirculating shrimp farming in the United States. There are now at least two dozen new farms of this type. Well, it provides a source of protein for the, the population of this country, and it locates the source of protein in this country. Benefits the environment, it benefits the consumer. It, it puts a fresh product, you know, uh, available to them with, with no processing needed to preserve that product for transportation to markets. We're in an analogous situation to what occurred 10,000 years ago when terrestrial ecosystems and human societies sort of shifted from hunter-gatherer to an agrarian lifestyle. Now we're doing the same thing on the sea, and the analogy is, is pretty striking. This story is you know, one of the most dramatic things going on in the planet right now. I mean, this is, this is a fundamental change in the way that people live on the planet, changing from hunter-gatherer, um, ways to obtain protein out of the sea, to, to a culture system. Well, there's really not much future in this. We're probably about the last few. There's probably never be another boat like this built, you know, shipping vessel. I have no regrets. I mean, I'm passionate about what we do. I always tell people, you know, you get into these type of businesses, commodity trading, on the commodity side like we are, you have to make sure you have galvanized stomach so that when the acid starts flowing, you don't get ulcers. <laughs> <laughs> you have your moments of being quite nervous, believe me. I don't regret anything. It's, it's been tough. It's, a, you know, uh, I don't know what the next 30 years would do. My, my son even asked me that. He, he wanted to be in this business, and, and it was a, a call that we made because he's now in his 30s. He got some good job offers, and I, I didn't know if this fight was, I don't know if you can make it through in the next 30, you know, and you got to plan that, you know? Uh, I don't see no future in it for a young man myself, so I think we're about the last of the Mohicans. And, and the young people have all gotten educated and they're doing other things now. You know, they're doctors, lawyers, and engineers, and... A more interesting solution to this is to take that nitrate, uh, phosphate building up in the system, macroalgae reactor, and then feed this macroalgae back to the shrimp. It's a source of phyconutrients and protein. Ultimately, we are what we eat, and uh, I think that uh, we have to be smart about how we raise shrimp. People a lot of times, you know, they say, what do you feel about shrimp farms in the United States? Hey, I said, you know, they're in the competition just like we are. Yeah. Hey, I support, I support anything they can do in the United States nowadays. Seafood 
is the second biggest factor in the trade deficit. Petroleum's number one, seafood's number two. We still don't even have policy in place to grow fish on a, on a competitive level. We don't spend as much of our budget on food in this country as other folks do in other countries. So the cheaper the food product, the more likely it is to sell. The U.S. product is, in many respects, a better product. It's going to cost a little more. I started uh, you know, studying aquaculture in 99 at, in Miami at, at the university, thinking this is going to be my opportunity, you know, that I'm going to be able to farm fish right here in Miami, you know, and you know, 15 years later, nothing. And we import over 80% of the food, the seafood that we eat. Um, you know, this is, it's ridiculous. First, we have to create an environment, a regulatory environment to grow and harvest fish. And then we've got to stand behind these companies that are going to step up to the plate and say, look, we're going to put it on, on everybody's plate. The alternative to cheap imported shrimp is exciting. And on a crowded planet, I think our food system must look like this. Safe, efficient, and ecologically intelligent. Raising shrimp here at home may force us to come to terms with our way of life and what it really means to be a modern human. But it's worth it. What we noticed being in town today is, you know, it's a unique community. This bay, when I was growing up, probably serviced uh, 30, 30 boats. Well, when the Vietnamese came here in the late 70s after the war, it, it got to be close to 200 real quick. Um, but hey, they they came to do whatever they could do to survive. I think they all came here trying to, to find a, an area what they did best back home. You know, you know, it was a survival thing for them, and that's why they ended up doing what they do. Kind of ironic now that imports from yeah. the same part of the world are, are threatening their livelihood. Yeah, they're actually fighting against that too, you yeah, know, and yeah, and, uh, yeah we, we've talked about that. And, uh, you know, they're, where, why is the price like it is? I said, well, you know, and, and they understand. Okay, we're rolling. 